May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. St. Luke 14, 16 through 17. In today's gospel, we join our Lord in the midst of a trap masquerading as a dinner party. Jesus has been invited by one of the chief Pharisees in order for the religious leader and his other guests to closely observe and gather evidence against the God for whom their entire way of life is supposed to be honoring. And just as their hospitality is fake, and a means to an end. So too is their intense piety proved to be false, or at least tragically incapable of bridging the gap between human sinfulness and divine holiness. These self-righteous monsters actually place a dying man next to Jesus to see if he will break the Sabbath to heal him. They scurry around the dining table to see who can get the best seat. They sit in judgment in the presence of God as if he needed to prove anything to them. In short, they act as if they are just entitled to the glorious promises of God. They act not that different from most Americans you run into a people who increasingly seek out a self-righteousness of their own through all the replacement religions our culture constantly offers to the bored and the restless and the comfortable. A recent poll published this week in the Wall Street Journal uh, found that Americans now attend weekly church at the rate of 26%. That's down from uh, 44% in 2000. That is a pretty grim trend. Worse, when I mentioned this to my wife, she made an interesting comment. Well, what counts for church for those 26%? After all, how many think church is going to a movie theater and getting a hug from Mickey Mouse while well, a tanned, really good-looking man tortures the scriptures to try and show how Jesus really is just like the hero of the latest comic book movie. And these, of course, are the churchgoers. What levels of decadence and superstition and fear does the average non-churchgoer stew in while dutifully paying homage to the dogmas and liturgies of our secular world. As we peer out into the angry and tribal land we inhabit, we find that the human person is invariably built to be religious. The only variable is whether we worship the self-righteous creeds of our fellow fallen men or whether we die to ourselves and follow the resurrected one. Throughout this dinner party, the resurrected one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, provides us with real and challenging examples of the sacrificial piety demanded by his words and deeds among us, demanded by the most human man to have ever lived to be seen by us, demanded by the example of the only man to conquer death. There it is, of course, right? There lies the only test an always dying human should use to determine what religion we follow. For an always dying human, it must be the resurrection or nothing. It must be the resurrection or greed. It must be the resurrection or disordered sexuality, resurrection or blind faith in politics or technology or consumption. For it is only as the reborn and committed followers of the 
crucified and resurrected one that we will ever submit to the true religion he outlines today. A religion, a, a way of life, designed to form our very actions into public proclamations of who God is and what God has done for his creation. We must begin that journey to being this living vessel of the truth by purging ourselves of all the self-righteous lies offered by our world as a temporary comfort. It is this desperate need which drives our loving creator to command us to do worldly defying acts. What are some examples from this dinner party? Just from this dinner party, examples include humbly taking the worst seat at a dinner, inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind to our banquets with the full knowledge that they can never repay us, or embracing a radical humility like our very life depends on it. Jesus reveals that the only cure for the evil selfishness which causes us to hurt ourselves and to hurt those we love is a radical giving of ourselves, a kind of living sacrifice, a living witness to our ultimate trust and the promises of God. Jesus reveals that our calling in this world, the calling of the Christ follower, is to be a living reflection of his victory over evil. It is through this lens that we must understand today's parable, a story about the saving work of Jesus and about how we live as redeemed beings made everlastingly secure in that victory. In the parable, the master of a great house sends his servant to welcome the invited guests to a great feast, and the guests refuse to come. It is helpful to remember that in a world without clocks, a first and second invitation to dinner would have been very, very necessary. You couldn't just say, come by at three or so. That's not how it worked. But refusing the second invitation after promising attendance to the first was an incredible insult, an abuse, in fact, which served as a declaration of war among the tribes of Arabia. Refusing to come to the feast is not a neutral act here. It is to spit in the face of the host, to deny his value in the starkest terms, and to declare war against him. This cultural background helps us to get a little bit of what Jesus is talking about here, right? Why the master is so angry when they don't come. The master of the house, of course, is God the Father who sends his servant to make good on the first invitation to the great end of the world feast presented in the Old Testament. One example, uh, probably the most beautiful, is in Isaiah, where we read, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of the people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 25, 6-8. With that prophecy in our mind, we should start to see that this banquet Jesus is describing here and again and again and again is about so much more than just being filled, though it's not, not about that. This banquet is about humanity and the entire creation being made whole. It is about a new world in which scarcity and pain and sadness are no more, a world in which death 
is abolished. To make this new world happen, if we follow the parable, God the Father sends his Son to reconcile the world to himself. But if we look at the Greek word which stands behind the fairly innocuous English word servant, we find that Jesus is describing himself as a slave. It is here that the Messiah reveals the radical humility which must flow from following his example. Jesus has made himself as low as a Roman slave by clothing his divinity and our fallen humanity. He has freely chosen to give all that he has, including his very life, for the sake of the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind humans dying of hopelessness in the streets of the city of men. In AD 33, all of that sacrifice and love was flowing through the veins of the living God. The whole weight of history was on his back. And the God slave was welcomed with the excuses of the self-righteous. And he still is. The Pharisees, who invited their creator to dinner to try and murder him, could not have embarked on this insane course of action unless they were sure that they were the most righteous people alive. They tragically believed that their adherence to the law in some areas, the areas that were easy to them, that their adherence to the law gave them the right to claim authority not over just the law, but of the lawgiver himself. It was a way of putting God in their debt. The same virulent cancer of the soul affects American Christians in countless, countless ways. Just a few examples. Uh, from the religiously progressive Christian who decides he is specially qualified to tell Jesus and his apostles what love means. Or uh, what about the... <coughs> excuse me. Or what about the uh, conservative Christian who thinks as long as he's not gay, he's sexually pure? What about the progressive Christian who thinks the church should look just like the 21st century? Or the conservative Christian, unwilling to purge the false Christianity of the 20th century? We, laymen, bishops, priests, deacons, lay deaconesses, we will never obtain some hypothetical level of righteousness by which we can judge God. In fact, we are called to an embodied trust which manifests itself in everything we do. If the head of our church made himself a slave to save the world, what does that mean we should do? It's a haunting question. And every part of us that bristles at the idea of surrendering to the infinite wisdom and providence of God is insane, illogical, and self-righteous. Every part of us that bristles at the idea of surrendering to the grace and justice of God is a part of us that just doesn't think sin is that bad, or at least doesn't think that my sin is that bad. which brings us right back to the tragedy of men and women absent from church or the tragedy of a church that has become absent from real worship. It is the purpose of the church's worship to remind us again and again and again how bad sin really is and just what it takes to set the table of the great banquet and feed the blind and the lame. In the Old Covenant worship, animals were slaughtered by the thousands, not because God enjoys the death of his creatures, no, but because human beings are so incredibly stubborn and self-deceiving that there is no other way to 
constantly teach and teach and reteach the people of God just what was the wages of sin. But even this violent liturgy of blood and death was only a shadow of the great slaughter of God the Son for the sins of the world. The death, St. Paul tells us, we show forth every single time we come to the Lord's Supper, every time we gather for the great banquet to which the God-slave beckons us, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, to taste what real world-saving humility is like. It is through this sacramental union with Christ and the new earth, which his presence defiantly proclaims, that we are increasingly prepared to become slaves of our own, to go out into the world and call our fellow men to the marriage feast of the Lamb, to compel them by the power of the Holy Spirit to flee the poverty of self-righteousness and to dwell in and with and through the Savior who defeats death with the cross, feeds us with his own body, and mercifully provides us with the only way to live in the confused chaos of our dying world. So when we taste today's feast, let us remember who and what it took to fill that table and save our hearts. And let us never turn down his call again. When we hear, come, for all things are now ready, let us always say, I too am ready. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.